I wanted to be a U.S. Coast Guard. I even wanted to go to the U.S. Coast Guard summer camp located in London, Connecticut, USA. I loved, I loved, I loved their mission. Prevent loss of life or injury in the, and, and to minimize property loss at sea by, listen to this, rendering aid to those in distress. Somebody knows where I'm going to with this. And guess what? I also ab absolutely love their motto, always ready. Always ready. In other words, we are on duty 365 days out of the year. I love the U.S. Coast Guard. I, I love, I still love them to this day. But at the age of 15, I can vividly remember reading an article, and guess what? The article made me so mad, that's why I can still remember it today. Never forgotten that article. It was about 150 fishermen, and they were trapped on a sheet of ice that broke away, floating in the middle of the river. It was on Lake Erie, and Lake Erie runs from Michigan uh, and, and right down to Illinois. And the Coast Guard spokesman by the name of Chief Petty Officer Roberts, he describes how the rescuers lowered baskets from helicopters. And they also took, took airboats and they, that blew them out over the ice and they started rescuing, rescuing people off the ice and from the water. Mm. And by the end of the day, it was a Saturday, it was a Sabbath, by the end of the day, 134 people had been plucked from the icy seas. Mm. And this is the part that made me mad. Listen up, listen up, right? Public opinion on the story included some unique perspectives. These fishermen are crazy. They're out of their mind to be fishing on ice in the middle of the winter. Hey, they deserve their fate. Matter of fact, you know what? We should charge them and pay the rescuers instead of paying the taxpayers' money paying them. They should have been left out there in the middle of the ice so that they will never forget the lesson. But as I read this true story, right, I found myself not relating to the fishermen or those who were condemning them. I found myself always <laughs> relating to those brave coast guards. But why? Because the idea of performing a search, hallelujah, a search and rescue mission seems so glorious and exciting to me at the age of 15. And this particular team located in Michigan, their mission motto was, this we do so that others may live. Oh, this we do so that others may what? may live. The U.S. Coast Guard has saved over a million people. They have rescued over a million lives since 19, 1790 when they first began. When you are a U.S. Coast Guard, hallelujah, when you are a U.S. Coast Guard, you don't care about why and how the person got in their mess. Somebody ought to say, man, I may be talking about some of you out there today. You, you are responding because you are committed to the rescue mission. Bethany's church, Bethany church, we have a mission to reach the who? The lost. The lost. The lost. We have a method to carry out the mission. We have a vision because without a vision, the mission fails the, me the method falls apart. Our mission is to make disciples and to live as Jesus Christ lived, as a loving witness through 
our actions. Our method involves being guided by the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Seventh day Adventists, we, we, we pursue, we pursue this mission through Christ like living, communication, and discipling, and teaching, and healing, and healing, and serving. Our vision, our vision, our vision, our vision, our vision is to one day see the restoration of all mankind. And to see our loving Lord and Savior, for us to be restored back to our formal places. Yet, 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 when, when, when we look at our mission, very, very few seem to display the same type of excitement and commitment as seen with the U.S. Coast Guard. Jesus came to this earth to seek and save the who? The lost. He was on a search and rescue mission. So, so, and, 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 and in Luke 15, that's our key text, right? In Luke 15, our key passage today, Jesus is teaching his disciples and those, those who identify themselves as Christ's followers about seeking the lost. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not what? Slack concerning what? His promises as some cunt what? Slackness, but he is long suffering toward us and not willing that any you, me, mommy, daddy, boys and girls, our neighbors and community should perish. But that all shall come to repentance. That beautiful. So, so Luke 15 is the greatest, watch this, watch this. Luke 15 is the greatest introduction lesson in evangelism 101. I know our college students know what I'm talking about. Huh? 101. Jesus is just not talking about evangelism outside the walls of the church. But he is talking about evangelism that is needed inside the church. He ain't expecting a response. Because some of us in church need to be evangelized. I ain't expecting a response. Jesus is speaking about all the various categories of spiritual lostness, including in the church. Let me stop, let me stop, let me stop. Shout I son little man, let us pray. Let, let, let us pray. Jesus threw, throw your weight around in here today. Construct before our eyes a beautiful collage, a picture, images of how wonderful all the wonderful acts that you have performed to save humanity, boys and girls and moms and dads, people of this earth. Oh, Holy Ghost, lock down any influence of the enemy at least for the next 30 minutes, Father, so that hearts may be convicted, if not converted, and that the followers of God may look up and to embrace their calling in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and the people of God said, Amen, 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 Amen. Jesus was on the shoreline of Jordan River, preaching and teaching, telling stories and parables and mesmerizing both near and far to hear the words of God, the very oft for of the book. And moved by the Spirit, he crosses over to the other side. Somebody say, other, the other side. I got another message about the other side. It's coming soon. The other side of Jordan to get to Galilee. And, and as he nears Galilee, Nassau, if you please, the makeup of those who are congregated 
begins to change from Jewish, the religious people, uh, to multitudes of Gentiles, publicans, and sinners, the unconverted people. Jesus loved to party. Some people say, why are you using that word in your sermons? Because he did. Jesus loved to party. I read in my Bible where Jesus loved to spend holidays with the most unpopular people. Oh, he loved to party with people who were not of his own social order, race, and, and denomination. Mm. Am I right, saints of God? Am I right? Am I right? Mm -hmm. He loved to party. He loved to, par to potluck with publicans and lepers and, and sinners. He did not just associate with sinners, but, but he actually enjoyed their company more than church people. I don't expect you to say amen. The record says he preferred to go to cocktail parties with the mafia tax collectors and strippers and, and, and rather than hang out with the common folk. He was a popular guy who hung around the most unpopular people. You see, organized religion, Judaism had made a mockery of the love and compassion of God. Help the church, Father. Jesus came to clean up the mess. So in doing so, criticism and harassment followed him for all the 33 years of his ministry, even when he was doing miracles and wonderful acts and saving and redeeming lives, criticizing church. So Jesus is nearing Galilee. I'm visualizing it in the vernacular of today. Businessman on Bay Street area are pressing toward him. Visualize it with me. Drug dealers and, and gang bangers from over the hill and, and from the hardest neighborhoods in Nassau are rolling in to hear the miraculous words. Every lifestyle marked as unacceptable came to hear the great preacher. He, he, you name it, you name the scum, you name the, 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 the elite the rich and the poor, they were all captivated and mesmerized by the words of the master. Are you mesmerized by the words of the master? Yet many of the Christian churches stood around murmuring at the amazing grace of Christ and favor that he showed toward people who were not like them. Oh, God. His words were liberating to some, yet for others they felt a piercing knife in their hearts. The Bible says God's word is what? Sharper. He now takes the sword. Stay with me. He now takes the sword, the word of God, and he pushes it deeper into their hearts with a parable. Luke 15 4 through 7, New International Version. Luke 15, 4 through 7, the parable of the lost sheep. Suppose one of you have a hundred sheep and lose one of them. Does he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? That's a question. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me, excuse me, party with me. I have found my Lord's sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there, there will be more rejoicing. There will be more partying in heaven over one Lower soul than a church that sits up Sabbath after Sabbath preaching, the people screaming. And that just turns going order on just a little bit. But when that lost soul comes in, angels are partying in heaven. Watch this. The sheep knows that it's lost. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. 
the sheep knows that it's lost, but can't find his way back home. They are crying out for our help. Church, they need our help. They need help to get them into the addiction program. They need help finding intervention. Because they're slipping in a state of psychosis. Every 46 seconds, someone in the world is, is, is committing dying of suicide. The Lord's sheep knows that the church is on the hill in the hill. They know where to go, but they can't find their way to get him back there. Luke 15, 8 through 9, the parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses what? How many? One, two, three, four? One. Doesn't she light the lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! Party with me! Oh, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing again in the presence of what? Angels of God over one sinner who repents. The coin in this, in, this, in this passage is the unchurched individual. They have no concept, no concept. They don't even know that they are lost. They're just lost. Someone needs to seek them out and to inform them of their reality. They know about Christmas, but they don't know about Jesus. They know about, but they, they know about Easter. They know about the Easter Bunny, but they don't know the Savior who died on the cross. Luke 15, 17 through 24, the parable of the lost son. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of a state. So he divided his property between two, between, between them. Not long after that, the young son got to gather all that he had. He set out for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Not just living, it said wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe what? Famine. In the whole country, and he began to be in what need. It's funny when people need. need. The only time people come running to Jesus is when they're in need. <clears throat> so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country. He, he who sent him to his fields to do what? Feed who? Pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods of the pigs that the, the pigs were eating, but but no. One gave him anything when he came to his senses. Get that again. When he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against thee and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still away distance off, his father saw him. That's the prodigal. That's the prodigal. That's the amazing, amazing, splendid love and, and, and of a father. Saw him and he was filled with what? Compassion for him. He ran to his son, and he drew his arms around him, and he kissed him. The son, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you, your heavenly heaven, and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put, put a ring on his, his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring a fattened cow. Bring a, it is time to throw a what? Party. 
Who's this? That's the backslider. In this context, potentially, potentially, your children who graduate from high school and, and you send them to, to, to Christian colleges and they may never come back through these church doors again. That's the context of the passage. You send them to college, you send them to school, or, 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 they may not even go to college, but they'll find a job, move out of the family nest, and live like a lot, live their life, allowing the turbulent water, the turbulent waters of physical pleasure, wash away their moral resolve. Luke 15, 20, 15, 25 through 31. Meanwhile, someone say, meanwhile, what a beautiful storyline, right? Meanwhile, the older son was in the what? Field. You guys know this one by heart. When he came near the house, he heard what? You know, partying music. It was something to celebrate, right? And dancing. I thought it was a party. They even had dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what is going on? The brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he, ha he, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became what? Angry and, and what? Refused to go. So his father went out and pleaded with him. The father sent the servant first. Then he said, you know, let me go and get this, this, this knucklehead. But he answered his father, look, look, all these years I have been slaving for you. Never disobeyed one order. You got any children like that? Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. The pathfinders. But when this son of yours who has squandered, lived his life in a reckless way, your property with what? Prostitutes. He comes home, you kill a fatted calf for him. My son, my son, my son, my son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was what? Dead. And it's what? Alive again. He was what? Lost. And it's what? Found. The elder brother is potentially... Lord, they ain't going to say amen. I, I'm telling you, Father, they ain't going to say amen on this one. Okay. The elder brother is potentially every active member of Bethany Church. See, she got her arms folded. Every board member, serving member, active member. You are, spiritually, you, you are spiritually blind by your own righteousness. Not inter interested in the salvation of others. I've been preaching for a full month on the calling, the call of duty to Christians. The appeal of God on the hearts of those who are disciples, making disciples. And many of us have no interest to the, for the salvation of souls. So, in Luke 15, we have three stories that relate to God's concern. Psychology is counseling with concern. They should know about concern. Her whole, her, whole, her, whole, her whole degree is based on the concern for others. Concern for the lost souls, concern for the value of souls, and concern for the salvation of souls. The, the, lost, 
the, for the concern for the loss of souls, concern for the value of souls, and concern for the salvation of who? Souls. I want you to know I'm preaching this message to myself too. I want you to know that. So, but most importantly, all three stories recorded in Luke 15 draw our attention to the task of evangelism. Stay with me. Don't get lost. By way of reaching four types of people that are lost outside of the church or inside of the church. Listen to me, Bethany, Bethany Church. From the, from, from the second I've rolled up into this church, people have been saying, Pastor C, I know you pastors love seeking out the loss on the outside, but we got plenty of people lost on the inside, missing in action or dead in action. I almost feel like shedding tears right now. Because so many times they feel like I'm hitting my head against a brick wall. And realizing what, what I say doesn't mean a thing, sister. It's about the spirit falling and convicting and converting converted Christians. So in the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus states that the shepherd goes after that one lost sheep. He is not concerned about the religious or the church folk. He is concerned about the one lost sheep. So in Luke 19, 10 states, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Oh, God. So, Bethany Church, I need for you to understand that Jesus was on a search and rescue mission. And only when he was able to find a lost soul was he willing to, to party. You haven't noticed Every time a soul was saved, there was a what? A party. Ain't no partying going on around here. So what about the search? What about the search part of evangelism? There was an evangelist, true story, that was visiting the African country of Ghana to preach a gospel message at a meeting. He said, this is what he said, I quote, when I realized that most of the, my audience was church people, I'm talking about you, I stopped preaching and asked the audience to go into the streets and invite people to come experience this evangelistic meeting. He said, the audience thought I was crazy. 30 minutes later, the church was packed with a huge number of people from the streets. When the meeting resumed, there was a sense of excitement, anticipation in the air that was absent before. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Any excitement and participation? No. Why? Because the sheaves are not in. They're looking all around, excited. Wow, all kinds of people. Then the preacher says, when I concluded my preaching and gave the invitation, several of the lost came and gave their lives to Jesus Christ. One of these individuals, right, was a man who asked if he could speak. This man shared that he was a witch doctor, a shareman, a priest that conjures up demonic agencies to heal people and to solve their problems. He said, for some months, I've, I've, I, I, the same evil spirit that he called upon is now tormenting me, and I'm fearing for my life. So one day, he, he left his village 
to get away from these spirits. As he walked on the streets, an old lady from the church pleaded with him to come in the church and to hear this visiting guest evangelist. It would have never happened if the church didn't go out on the streets that day. And seeing, seeing her invitation to him was a sign from God. He came into the meeting. And as he listened to the word of God, he began to feel the change of torn up torment, weakening off his body, his heart, and soul. This man said, man, the evangelist gave the appeal, the invitation to receive Christ. He felt a total release of bondage falling off him. He concluded, he concluded, he concluded by thanking the old lady for inviting him to church. And the church roared in with great jubilation. The power, the power of one soul. So, many of you, many of us are sitting and listening here today have lost our joy and passion for being part of God's last day church search and rescue mission. Why? Oh God. Why? Because, because many of us are, 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 are carrying, are, are, are carrying, carrying ourselves like the elder son of the prodigal. You have been in church for so long that you have lost your interest in the search and rescue mission. Listen to me, the murmuring elder, elder son, the murmuring um, Pharisees, the teachers of the law that listen to Jesus telling the story are two of the same. So they could not find no pleasure in the repentance of sinners because of their own self-righteous ways. So when the elder son, when the elder son in the story of the prodigal son tells his father, all these years oh, I've been, been, been slaving for you and you I never disobeyed an order or a command. I've been vegetarian all my life. I never cuss, never swear. Read my Bible every day. Pray, 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 grow, grow, grow. The Pharisees and the teachers were probably thinking how there is finally someone who we can relate to in the story. He's the only one in the story who's not crazy. But Jesus then drives home the point uh, that the younger son, the younger son, the, young, the, the younger brother wasn't the only one who showed a disregard for his father. Both sons were what? Lost. So, so the young son was in a terrible state. Watch this. The young son was in a terrible state. He had, he had, he had, he had ulterior motives, right? He wasn't caring about restoration. He just wanted something to eat. He was coming back home uh, with the wrong motives in, in, in mind. But the elder son was a whole lot worse off. He had no idea of his true spiritual condition. They were equally in need of being found. In the parable, in the, par in the, parable, the father went looking for the elder son by way of the servant. Just as the shepherd, the, 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 the shepherd actively searched out for the lost sheep and the woman searched out for the what? Lost what? Coin to find it. Many faithful, many faithful, many of us, many faithful Christian attendees are the elder brother. Many Adventist Christians are the elder brother. Many Bethany members are the elder brother type. I, I'm really paying right now, Miss. I'm being honest. I ain't trying to jump down nobody's throat. I just have no other way to say it. So. 
Many faithful church attendees are elder brother type. Believe as long as you obey the rules, you deserve the blessing. Think their motives are to, to, to re, uh, the, the, their motives are to receive, not to show love to Father through loving and serving people. Like this elder, elder son, you really believe that some people, their previous lifestyle are unforgivable. They have no right in church. Like many church members, you take issue with certain types of people. Let me start calling names, including the alcoholics that you see on the street, the homeless ones that smile. You let one come rolling up in the church. For most people are making over thirty thousand dollars a year, or fifty, or some even a hundred thousand. He resented his father's joy and refused to share it. Can you believe that? Can you, can you, believe, can you, can you believe your child resenting a mother and father's joy in seeing a son being redeemed from a, a, a lifestyle that always heads toward death early in life? Can you believe that? cannot celebrate the resurrection of a family member? 